Hello everyone and welcome to the snack bar. My name is Jerry and with me I have Hi, I'm Jed. Yes. And today we are going to talk about two films, I guess, one with spoilers, one without. So let's talk about the one that we are not going to go deep into which is Solo, a Star Wars story. So yeah. This is this was the Phil Lord and Chris Miller film that I was looking forward to, but they got fired at the last minute and Ron Howard came back. Uh I have to admit, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, so I wasn't really looking forward to this film. But I was morbidly curious to see what the final product was, and it was yeah, really boring. Yeah. But that's on me, Aww. I feel, because I'm not interested <laughs> in the character. But I yeah, think yeah. for all the drama, for all the drama this film had, the fact that it was a pretty competent film, it's I give I'll give my hats off to them because we've seen what you know films with. Bad production can turn out, which is fantastic for you know, yeah. Yeah, so and I mean, as much as it pains me to admit, something like Justice League also shows like the scars of a director change of executive meddling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, more more than Solo. Yeah. So, mm, so what do you think of Solo? Since you are the Star Wars fan, and I think that you know ninety percent of the world are Star Wars fans. And 10% of us are assholes. So, what do you think, Jen? Yeah, so before we get into that, I guess, like, your relationship with Star Wars is perhaps uh, a little bit like my relationship with Harry Potter, where it's not something that I grew up with, but I, I, like, I'm interested to see what the new movies are like and maybe go back and familiarize myself with the old movies. And I think you've done a lot more of your homework with Star Wars than I have with Harry (laughs) Potter. But... Like, we don't have the uh, emotional connection to those respective franchises because we didn't necessarily grow up with them and vice versa, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so um, with with Solo, I honestly really enjoyed this movie. Going in, I was mm-hmm. very skeptical. Um, I think I, I said that I would like to travel to two alternate universes. So one alternate universe is the one in which Phil Lord and Chris Miller stayed on the movie. The other alternate universe is one in which the movie exists as it does now, but I knew nothing about the director change, nothing about any of the -the behind-the-scenes drama, nothing about Eldon Aaron Rick needing to get an acting coach, and I just went and watched the movie blind because I don't think I've been able to tell anything was quote-unquote wrong. You know what I mean? I mean, I think I would because I found it boring. So, because, okay, to be fair, out of all the Ron Howard films, I think the recent ones that I saw... Rush and In the Heart of the Sea, I fell asleep in both of them. And even though I really like Rush in the end, but I think Ron Howard doesn't have the youthful energy that's required for Star Wars. To me, at least. Because I I think it's not even... It's it's not even the best looking Star Wars film. Like, say what you want about The Last Jedi and Rogue One. At least they were so pretty. At least you can... You can have you know, a frame of that movie and it's so beautiful to look at. But Solo is just dark and you have no idea what's going on in the fight scenes because, you know, it's just a lot of cutscenes. It's just a lot of shaky cams and... Oh, man. Like, I I couldn't tell what was going on half the time. Did you have that problem? No. Uh, I'll... I'll, I'll, Like, I don't want to invalidate your opinion and I think you... Like, your voice, the majority opinion, I think in general people are at best okay with this. So I'll tell you what, I went into this movie, I didn't really know how it was going to turn out, and then a long time ago comes up on screen, and then it was a time of lawlessness, and I freaked out. I was so thrilled. The movie hits the ground running. It opens with a really energetic sequence. It sets up this kind of like Dickensian orphan thing. You get a really good look at where Han comes from, like the circumstances that he grew up in, what those are. And I felt like, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about the movie as very safe and very boring, but I felt it was very energetic and very entertaining. Uh, I think that it went a bit long. I think two hours and 15 minutes is a bit long. And I checked out a little bit during, ironically, the Castle Run. I think the Castle Run was a tiny bit repetitive, even though it had its cool moments. But uh, here's 
like like when I hear people say Elden Aaron Rick is not charismatic enough or he is he does not match up to Harrison Ford, I kind of go, well yeah, I think that's the point. I what I like about the approach of the character is in this movie we're meeting Han and he's someone who is not cool yet. And he desperately wants to be cool. He desperately wants to siphon off coolness from the cool people around him. So like you know, like Woody Harrelson, Thandi Newton, uh like Lando, you mean uh Donald Glover. He's just trying to learn how to be cool from all these people who surround him. And I feel that there are a lot of elements in this movie which are really, you know, generic or formulaic, but I think Star Wars uh, is in part kind of about reinterpretation of formula because I, I tell everyone, you know, if you go back to A New Hope, that's like a rehashing through a fantasy sci-fi lens of age-old tropes, of mythological tropes, of stuff, you know, like all the way back from Greek myths, Arthurian legend, biblical stuff. So... I think that this movie follows a lot of crime movie or caper movie, heist movie formula. Uh, where I thought it sparked the most was in the relationship between Han and Chewie. Um, the, the meeting between Han and Chewie, the first meeting, which happens early on in the film, of course, I did not expect that to play out the way it did. And after that scene, I was totally on board with this film. Uh, like, like, that scene, that was the right attitude. That was the right, like kind of vibe, the mix of uh, humor and the peril the character is put in and how the way he gets himself out of situations, he squirms his way out of situations. I felt that sort of rang very true to me. It lined up very well with the character. Sorry, I've been rambling for a long time. Does, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. Uh, like, like I guess part of why I can accept Alan Aaron Rick as Han Solo is because I watched the young Indiana Jones Chronicles. So I have seen Sean Patrick Flannery try to be a young Harrison Ford. And Sean Patrick Flannery is a lot more conventionally handsome and like hunkier, sort of 90s boy band looking than Alan Aaron Rick. But I felt that they were on par. They were about the same. And I think Sean Patrick Flannery, like, he he was cooler. And I actually liked seeing uh, Han being a bit of a dog, being very earnest. And you see where he gets his cynicism from, what turns him into this kind of world-weary, like, like you know, this, this guy who is unfazed by anything and he's not in this for your revolution, princess. And you see the relationships that resulted in that, the experiences that resulted in that um well you said a lot of things <laughs> that i i i'm really glad that you feel the way that you do i wish i was into star wars i really do no no and it's I it's think, totally okay yeah yeah i i don't really understand what han solo character is supposed to be and i'm even more confused after watching this because he's supposed to be this he's he's supposed to be a very um he's for himself kind of guy and there are certain things that he does in this film that don't don't exactly portray that kind of character so i was really confused why he cared about other people yeah that's that's yeah. actually that's a very very good point that you've raised and i really like that you've said that i think that as originally conceived uh in a new hope Han is very much a gunslinger. He is an outlaw. He is a character from a western. You know, he is, uh, like in in High Noon. I forgot who it was in High Noon. God damn it! But yeah, basically the kind of a gate with the holster, with the boots, the vest. So he's meant to be a space cowboy. So I think what we learn in this movie is how he got there. How he got from being someone who cares to someone who doesn't, or at least. Someone who has learned to pretend he doesn't care. Does does that yeah, so so it's like it's kind of seeing like he wasn't always that way, and there was some key inciting incidents in his life that turned him that way. So I guess one of my issues with the movie is that the important things that happened to Han happened within like two weeks. All the important things in his life. 
as opposed to like in the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles where that's spread out over 20 years and you see him as a like eight and then you see him as like 19. So like, like I, I've heard it said that maybe this would work better as a TV series and I don't know because I feel like that would kind of draw things out unnecessarily but as it stands, yeah, part of the problem of the movie is they are rushing to hit those important points. You know, he needs to meet Chewie, he needs to meet Lando, he needs to get in the Falcon, he needs to get the Falcon from Lando. Most importantly, how did he get his name? Yeah, uh, like, that's. I think that's never really been a thing. I think we have... Yeah, I, I like that scene. I like that scene because um, it goes to the point of someone building, searching for an identity. And I think that's uh, one of the themes of the movie is he wants to make himself in a certain image. And how does he make himself in that image? How does he try to assemble building blocks of coolness to turn himself into the Han he sees in his mind's eye, you know, into the Han he imagines himself to be? So, like, when you get to Mos Eisley Cantina, when you get to A New Hope, when he's meeting uh, Obi-Wan and Luke, and he's boasting about how fast the Falcon is, he's boasting about the castle run, uh, he wants to be that guy, that cool guy. So how does he get there? What was he like before that? You know, so I, I thought that that's what the movie went into. And it's, I mean, it's a gamble because... You don't want to ruin the mystique of the character, but at the same time, I don't think this is like the Joker, where the Joker not having a fixed origin is a key gimmick to the character, something that he plays himself. Like, I don't think Han was being particularly mysterious about where he comes from. I think that, I'm sure he told all this stuff to Leia eventually, you know what I mean? Kira. I I like Kira's character. I'm so happy you said yeah. that. Yeah, she she's a good character, and I really like the chemistry between Han and Kira. So kudos to the actors. Um, she's a lot better than I thought. I'm glad that we have another kick-ass woman in the Star Wars series, and I like her decision at the end. It was cool, and yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a good character. I think that out of everyone, she's probably my favorite because she. She doesn't have the baggage, I guess, of Star Wars with her. She just feels new. And she doesn't feel like a re-thread yeah. of anything. Although I don't like that she's the, the love interest. But, you know, whatever. She, I think she's more than that, though. Especially at the end. I, I think it's very, very important that she's the love interest. I think that there were times in this movie where I found myself going, Oh, I hope these two end up together. And then I go, Oh. Yeah, <laughs> and and I think because once once you you think of her as a love interest, you have certain expectations. So okay, I don't adore Amelia Clark. I I'm very interested to see how this would have worked with Tessa Thompson, who was in the running. Uh, I'm very interested to see how this would have worked with Jessica Henwick, even though she's already been in Star Wars. So uh, I feel like the runner up list is more interesting than who we ended up with. But but but. On a level of her being a character, I really, really love what it did because it is like, okay, Han's relationship with this person is a defining moment in his life. How this results turns him into who he is, you know? And uh, I look at her as very much like a Bond girl. And I think like, like the idea of that she's... The people whom she's working with, how much she knows, how much she's telling having kind of a past and and you know what that what the implications are for our hero with regards to her and her relationships that felt like a bond movie and i really really like that i think we better move on soon so final thoughts i didn't like it but i see you know after hearing yeah. all your points i really understand why a star wars fan would I love it and I'm really happy that you guys are getting these films to sort of understand your characters but you already had that before Star I mean before Disney kind of ruined canon so I don't know um yeah so I yeah so I don't uh like like I mean the sorry just just like final thoughts before before we move on 
Uh, I love this movie. A lot of Star Wars fans don't love this movie. I think a lot of Star Wars fans are kind of blinded by... Disney. Disney and the corporation and what Disney stands for. Yeah, and I think we went into this in The Last Jedi review. Disney as a corporate entity has done a lot of scummy things, just as many corporate entities have. But think about it objectively. Did Fox handle this property any better? No, they did not. And I think there's a very dangerous conception. Okay, this is overstating it, but the expanded universe as a substitute for movies, I don't like that idea. I I think the expanded universe is a supplement. And I think that when you have so much material written by so many people, uh, it's so difficult to keep it all together. And in fact, I I have a lot of respect for Leland Chi, the Holocron people, and the story group people, because when you watch Solo, when you look at the little references that are made at the timeline clues, it is made by people who love this stuff. It is not made by people who want to... Make money. Kill it, you know. Oh, okay. And... Yeah, and, and I, I mean, everyone wants to make money, but it's not solely motivated by that. Mm. Like, I don't understand someone who can walk out of Solo and say, this is made by people who want to ruin my childhood. You know, it's not Transformers. And, like, not at not by a long stretch. And I have been hearing some Star Wars fans complaining about this series, but all of, all of it really boils down to, this wasn't the Star Wars I imagined. You know, so I... Yeah, and, and that's the thing... The, like, like I mean, it's it's very similar to okay, maybe bad example, but Cursed Child. Cursed Child is not the Harry Potter a lot of people imagine. The casting is not a lot. It's not the Harry Potter a lot of people imagine. And I think it's so tricky when we as fans engage with material where we have to come to terms with the fact that as much as we're invested in it and as much as we've created a world in our minds, we don't own it. The creators do. Okay, but here's the thing about. Here's the thing about Cursed Child. The thing about Cursed Child is that none of the characters act like they do. And it is very poorly written. That, right. That's my main problem with it. I don't mind if it's like Fantastic Beast, where you don't have the main characters. Yeah. As long as it's well written, that's all I want. But Cursed Child is not like that at all. And I think... Okay, Cursed Child is basically Phantom of Menace, I guess. Where it's poorly written. It sort of ruins characters. It... it it it's not good, but then when you look at the Last Jedi, you look at you look at uh Rogue One, you look at Solo or Star Wars stories. At the very least, they are competent. They are well. They're not well written, but they are they are fine. You know, if you don't like them, you you still admit they are just fine. There's nothing too wrong about them. It's not like it's not boring like Phantom of Menace, and it's not mind boggling like stupid like Clone Wars where you just want to rip your eyes off because you're so bored and you don't understand what's going on on screen and everything is so ugly to look at so I think Star Wars fans just need to chill out I think Disney is doing a whatever job I I think that they should calm down as well Disney because they are I, I don't know why Star Wars fans aren't used to seeing that much Star Wars in their face even though in my opinion, Star Wars has always been in my face, and I'm not even a Star Wars fan. And this was before Disney bought Star Wars. Like I had Clone Wars, right, the yeah. Clone Wars series in my face. I had the comics in my face. I had all the the quotes from the movies in my face. So I don't understand why people are suddenly complaining that Disney is oversaturating Star Wars. Yeah, I I get where you're coming from, and I'm gonna try to maybe explain that a little bit. I think. People were not expecting or particularly wanting for movies apart from the main line, apart from one to six. And Lucas, you know, he talked about uh, doing, George Lucas talked about doing a seven, eight, nine at some point. And then he was like, whatever. So I guess when we're seeing movies now, the, the saturation is like people are saying, oh, they're trying to milk the cash cow. Which, yeah, of course, you don't think Fox is going to do that. If they had a Fox, try it. And the best Fox could do with George Lucas in control was to remaster and turn those movies into 3D. And sure, you know, that does not add story. That does not change uh, the way you look at at, at the stories in your mind. But that's much more shameless than what is being done now. I think that... If you look at The Force Awakens, if you look at Rogue One, if you look at 
um, Last Jedi and even Solo. Like there are, there's effort being made to tell these stories, and I think a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that. A lot of people don't want to acknowledge that pe- that the the filmmakers, the creative people, they love this stuff. They're trying, and I mean, when someone like Ryan Johnson tries to to kind of reinvent the wheel or tries to take things in an unexpected direction and tries to give the story uh, like a weird kind of energy, people don't appreciate that. So it's like, do you want it to be left alone and then complain that you don't get any new stuff? Mm. Or do you want new stuff and complain about the new stuff? So the new stuff is not going to be all good, for sure. That's the same with any, any property. So it's like looking at it in perspective, looking at it, in comparison to how the franchise has been handled in the past and in comparison to how other franchises are being handled currently. Mm. Well, Star Wars fans, just calm down. That's all I have to say. I think... Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. The Last Jedi, I forgot what her name is, the, the Asian girl. Rose, yeah, Rose. yeah, Kelly Marie Tran. People are very mean to her online and I don't like it. They keep calling her fat and Asian and whatever. It's terrible. You don't have to like her character. Don't don't be mean about it, you know? Just calm down. I don't like her either, but I don't I don't make fun of her. You're terrible people, nerds. Okay. Yeah, like like I totally agree with what you're saying. And like I told you with my review of The Last Jedi, I had people defending slavery on my comment section. So uh the MAGA people, the Trump people hate the movie so much. They hate uh, that there are characters of diverse ethnicities, they hate that there are women in charge, they hate that Luke Skywalker is shown to be fallible, you know, they hate all this stuff because it does not conform to their ideology and then they accuse Kathleen Kennedy of pushing an agenda, which I roll, you know, okay, so Kathleen Kennedy, I'm sure, like many producers, uh, she's a control freak and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I don't think you'd get this stuff leveled against her if she were a man. I think that sexism has a very big part to play in this, like, mass mob hatred of Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah. All right, let's go on to less sad So, things. yeah, I guess we'll leave it at that. I think, like, the relationship of Star Wars fans and the franchise. So, after hearing all the Star Wars talk and all about ruining friendship, uh, sorry, it's not friendship, childhood, I'm really glad, and, and people hating on Disney just because they're successful, I'm really glad that when the goodbye, sorry, not goodbye, that when the Christopher Robin trailer came out, people were very positive on that. So that was a, that was a really nice thing to see, that Disney is, you know, not being hated on for being good at what they do. I'm just saying. Okay, sorry. Let's go on. Yeah, I think the like, like yeah, yeah. I mean, sorry, very, very quickly. Like Christopher Robin, I think that's that's a cool take on an idea. It's a little bit depressing as an idea, but I'm very. <laughs> Like, oh, he's having a midlife crisis, but I'm interested to see where it goes. Yeah, I think that that people who have a relationship with Winnie the Pooh, it's not the same level of fanaticism as people who have a relationship with Star Wars. Like me, you know. No, oh, but I remember <laughs> so the Paddington... Yeah, it's, it's just that. Yeah, I remember the Paddington trailer getting a lot of hate. But it turned out to be right, a really, yeah, really good yeah. film, so I'm very happy. Yes. I love Paddington I haven't so seen much, that yet! The second one. Uh, I, oh, you'll uh, love it. I love sure. the first one. It was so charming. And um, anyway, the okay, I, I'm going to talk about the film that I saw called Rampage. And I think... <laughs> you got around to it, yay! I think I've never thought as The Rock as being a bad actor. So this is the first time I saw him without his charisma. And he's terrible. <laughs> he's so bad in this. <laughs> the story is shit Like he is Okay seriously The Rock I'm sure he's a really nice guy He needs to He needs to take his ego down He is so He's like I'm so cool Just look at me Everyone Every girl loves me But they can't have me That kind of thing It's like Just stop What are you doing And The, the monster fights are so Bad And I, I don't know It's so violent For the sake of being violent I Okay fine But they are monster fights Whatever I didn't realize that this was a disaster film, so I was very uncomfortable with seeing that many deaths in a PG film. Um, what else is that? The villains were shit. They were so yeah, bad. Like yeah. they weren't. I, I I get what they were trying to do with them. Okay, I get that they were trying to be campy fun, but you, it, 
It's so bad. I don't know what it is about it. It's so annoying. I wanted to punch the guy in the face, the guy from the office, and still the the one from um, what's that film called? Watchmen. I I never liked her in Watchmen as the still. Jake Lacey and Malin Aterman. Oh my god, she's so bad. She's so bad yeah. in this as well. I I just everything <laughs> about this film is so bad. <sighs> it sucks. Don't watch it. I did. I regretted it. Well, actually, I don't regret it because Lucas wanted to watch it and he had fun. So I'm very happy for him. I hate this film. He owes me, but I drag him to all the indie films that I can get. So he gets bored in them. So I guess that's this. This I guess this is my pay. My payday, you know, watching this film with him. Hated this film. It's terrible. Don't watch it. Yeah, we. It's shit. We all we all make sacrifices for the people we care about. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, well, I I talked about Rampage uh in a previous episode, and I think like I was less bothered with it than you were. But all the points you have made are extremely valid, and a part of me is a bit sad that this is a higher Rotten Tomato score than Tomb Raider. <laughs> Yeah. Which is a much better video game movie. It is borderline good. It's a borderline good film. Yeah, yeah. yeah, It's a borderline good movie. It works. It makes sense. Development. And it doesn't feel like... (laughs) You know, the main character is invincible. It's a good actress. Yeah. God, what the hell? (laughs) This is unfair. (laughs) (laughs) You know why? Because I think people... I love that. I think people are so... Oh, oh... Because she's a female character, so when she acting this way, it's kind of sexist and whatever. And then you see The Rock, and it's like, oh yeah, The Rock is cool. Let's give him a pass. I don't. Uh, it's so. It's so unfair. Yes, okay, yes. you know what? I think a lot of it is that. And and I'm not saying that the critics are wrong, whatever. Because everyone is entitled to their own opinions. It's just no, that no, no. it doesn't. Yeah. And I don't yeah. understand how some people who like Rampage don't like Tomb Raider more. Like. Tomb Raider was at least a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alright, Jed, what have you seen good, this good. week? Get it out of your system, <laughs> and I agree. Uh, Nothing. Yeah, nothing besides Solo, I guess. Oh, yeah, you, you went to um, Germany, right? <laughs> Solo and... Uh, yeah, I was, I, I was, uh, I did like a, with my family, a package tour of Europe, which is our... We we did a similar tour a few years back, and this time it was Eastern Europe, and a lot of horrible things happened to our tour group. Oh, okay, hang on. Let let let's stop this movie talk for all and tell tell us what's what happened. Sure, yeah. So this is a package tour. Um, I first of all, I think the tour manager did a really really good job because a lot of horrible things happened, and he had to manage a lot of stuff. And you go on a package tour because it's a lot cheaper than if you're going to do this stuff by yourself. And the give and take is that you miss things. You don't get to hit everything you want to hit. So, like, we spent an afternoon in Berlin and I felt that was very, very short. But on the whole, it was an okay experience. Uh, However, a lot of stuff happened. It was very eventful. Uh, Three people had their passport stolen. So that was really, really nerve-wracking. And my mom fell and broke her hand. Oh, no. Uh, I started the trip with food poisoning, ended it with the flu. I think seven other people had food poisoning as well. Um, Someone had like a thousand euros stolen. Like, yeah, a lot of crap happened to this group, but we made pretty good friends. And in fact, we're having some of them over to our house this afternoon. So that's why we're record- I'm recording this in the morning on a public holiday. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <clears throat> Man, I-, yeah. I haven't been on a package tour for some time. Have I? No, yeah, I haven't been on a package tour for some time. Wait, no, I went to Europe on a package tour. Yeah, I think tour. like that was all. Right, yeah. And and I guess like like okay, my main goal of this trip was to go to Budapest ah. and hold Black Widow and Hawkeye around and and do what happened in mm-hmm. Budapest. So I did that. So I'm very happy I did that. And then, like, I held Red Skull in front of the Brandenburg Gate and hope people did not call me out on it. You know, I... You went to New Schwanstein Castle, right? Schloss New Schwanstein. We saw it from far oh, away, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought... I'm I'm surprised there hasn't been a Hollywood movie made on New Schwanstein yet and how it was built and the guy behind it. I forgot his name. But it's a very... The Mad King Ludwig. Yes, I think he's... He's so Oscar Beatty, his story, because he's gay. 
He's a disturbed yeah, man. Yeah. Oh. The Wagner thing. Yeah. Yes. The connection to Wagner. You could have so much cool music in that movie. And he died a mysterious death. So I'm surprised Hollywood hasn't tried to yeah, do yeah. Uh, an Oscar bait film with that yet. Maybe soon. I don't know. Like I'm, sh- I'm sure there's probably a European movie made in the 40s yeah, or 50s. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Maybe there's like a silent film about King Ludwig. I'm surprised that people didn't... Uh, people still don't know who he is, even though New Schoenstein is the castle that inspired Sleeping Beauty. Or oh, Cinderella, whichever one, I forgot. And his story is so interesting. <laughs> his story is really, really interesting. Yeah. Like, like the, the whole thing of, you know, he grew up on a hill and he looked at the other hill and was like, I'm going to build a castle on that other hill one day. And he did. And he didn't even see it happen. Like, like he didn't see it finished. Yeah, like like the, it's the kind of baller like I want a castle and you get a castle. But and and also like the way all of these uh you know like like European monarchs are inspired by stuff they've seen in their mm-hmm. travels. Like he went to France and he loved like Versailles and things that he saw there. So he wanted to recreate that back home. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go on to Deadpool 2. Sorry, I forgot about that. I heard somewhere yeah, that... we have made wait, wait a long time. <laughs> I heard uh, that there was a working title for this film called Deadpool 2. Working title as the, sub- as the subtitle. Wish that happened, but never mind. So what happened to Deadpool 2, yeah, Jet? Too, yeah. Okay, so yeah, first of all, like um, I at this moment, I remember my very, very first episode uh, with you on the stack bar was Deadpool mm. 1. So, like, it kind of feels like a full circle moment, and thanks for keeping me around that long. Thanks for tolerating me. I should be the one saying <laughs> it. Can I just say, fun. I was thinking maybe, like, our tagline should be uh, the snack bar with a guy who knows what he's doing and a girl who should probably watch more indie films. Because you... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short. You totally know what you're doing, and you watch more indie films than I do, I think. No, I probably don't. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen Isle of Dogs yet, uh, and that's okay. not an indie film. But okay, yeah, continue. All right, so Deadpool Two is the sequel to Deadpool, which this is a big surprise that that movie got a sequel because like it didn't do well, people didn't like it, and Ryan Reynolds like ruined his career. With Worse that movie. than Green Lantern, uh, some would say. Anyway, yes, exactly. That's on the poster, right? Deadpool worse than Green Lantern. So in this movie. Deadpool gets kind of an uninvited guest in the form of Cable slash Nathan Summers, played by Josh Brolin. So he's a time traveler from the future, and he's come to the present to settle some scores and to deal with some problems. So the target, the guy he wants to get rid of, and we don't really know why, is this kid named uh, Russell Rusty Collins. He calls himself Fire Fist. So he has pyrokinetic powers. He's being kept in this orphanage where he's probably being abused by the principals and orderlies, and so Wade has to kind of protect him and unre- and reluctantly team up with him against uh, Cable. In the meantime, Wade, he's trying to settle down into his life with Vanessa, uh, his girlfriend played by Maureen Baccarin, so he's juggling all of his mercenary, super anti-hero antics with that. And he's trying to put together his own team of uh, badass, like, morally compromised mutants called the X-Force. So, uh, one of the people who joins that team is Nina Thurman Domino, played by Zazie Beetz. So, she has the power of supernaturally good luck. She can influence probability in, uh, to her advantage. So, he's sort of like, together with this bunch of people and figuring out where, what's family, you know, is this a family film... Uh, and going on adventures and seeing whether or not there's going to be a third one and maybe an X-Force movie. That's Deadpool 2. I have a question. Um, how is how is luck a mutation? Yeah, so that's that's actually very, very... It's an interesting idea. Like, she can... Inf- I think... Okay, I think about it in terms of, like, it's a little bit like Spider-Sense after the Okay. Fact. So with Spider-Sense... Peter Parker can sense things that are going to happen, things that are wrong. And it's actually very, very vague. So uh, so I think, like, luck is spider sense you can act on. 
so things around her happen the way she wants things to happen, like kind of metaphysically at a at like a quantum level. I see. Okay. Okay. So anyway, yeah. Deadpool two. I wasn't a huge fan of the first one. I really liked this mm-hmm. because it felt more like a movie, and it was a story, and it wasn't trying to be a parody of something while also trying to, while also being that parody. It's trying to parody. Um, thir- yeah, uh, I thought Ryan Reynolds was great as usual as Deadpool. Um, <clears throat> I, I wasn't a huge fan of Vanessa and Wade's relationship, but for some reason, this one I really liked it. Uh, yeah, okay. and. Yeah. It's a great film. I, I really enjoyed myself, laughed a lot. Uh, I really liked the references that they had. I think there was like one too many Green Lantern jokes. And I would just yeah, I would just yeah, like to say, I Ryan Reynolds, you. you don't listen to this. But I would just like to say, you met your wife in Green Lantern. The whole movie cost about, I think, $100 million or whatever. It was just... It was just so that you and your wife can meet. So you have to be more grateful towards that film. I'm just saying. I understand I understand why you're angry at X-Men Origins Wolverine because that was shit. But stop making fun yeah, of Green yeah. Lantern, man. You you met your wife and you pretend I know it's a, just a joke, but you pretending that Green Lantern is one of the worst things that that has ever happened to you. I don't think that's very nice when that was how you met your wife. I agree. I totally agree. And in addition to that, I honestly think Green Lantern is not as bad as people say it is. I think that it's not great. It's not brilliant. It makes a lot of mistakes. But I am in the camp that thinks that if they had made a second one, they could have easily corrected everything that was wrong with the first one. If they made a second one with Mark Strong as an evil Sinestro, that could have salvaged it. They could have brought it back. It's been done before. I didn't like the Green Lantern film that they had, but... I think it's not very yeah, nice to make fun it. of a film that so many people worked on. I understand doing it once, yeah. but I think, you know, throughout his entire campaign, he all he's been doing is making fun of Green Lantern. I think that's not very fair to the people who did work behind the scenes, who that was probably their career highlight. And yeah, yeah. And it's... Let's, let's remember that nobody forced Ryan Reynolds to be yeah. Green Lantern. And... Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, uh, sorry to cut in again, but Josh Brolin does not go around saying Jonah Hex ruined my life. I hate Jonah Hex. Kill so Jonah did, Hex. Which he he, he kind of did in this press. Which has every right, he has every right to. I think he was egged on. Okay. I think people were like trying to poke him to say that, yeah. And he was like, I never want to think about it again. And then he moved on. Mm-hmm. So it's not like Josh Brolin's entire life has been about how horrible Jonah Hex is, you know? Even though Jonah Hex is very horrible. And Jonah Hex is a much worse movie than Green Lantern. Okay. I've never seen Jonah Hex. I just know it looks like shit. And it's the one with Megan Fox in it. Good. Yeah, spare yourself the misery. <laughs> Will Arnett is oh. in it. For some reason. Oh, uh, that was pre-TMNT yeah, yeah. too. I, th- I, I was very surprised. Um, yeah. And pre-Lego Batman. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. What else is there to talk about? Do you, do you have anything to say about this film that stood out to you? I know you didn't really like it. Or, or you didn't like it probably as much as I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was a little bit disappointed by this movie and like listening to you talk about why you liked it, I think it, it makes sense that a lot of it stems from uh, our respective reactions to the first film. Like I think that this movie by design didn't have a lot of structure and it was like things happen and then other things happen. And part of the idea is that it's a crazy adventure, let's all go along for the ride. And I felt that because everything is a big joke, which, you know, it has the right to because it's a Deadpool movie, during the emotional scenes, I was second-guessing whether I'm allowed to really be emotionally invested. Whether or not the filmmakers are just going to go, psych, you know, you dummy, you fell for it. So I could not get invested in any of the emotional scenes at all. Mm. And I think that it, it really, like, it undercut the stakes. Uh, like, you've got life or death crazy things going on, but because everything is a joke and nothing really can happen to Wade, it undercut the stakes. And the first movie had an origin story arc for you to track. So I like that. This movie has an arc for Wade as well. It has an arc for Wade and Vanessa. 
you know. But I I think that what they did to the Vanessa character in this film and the direction they took her in uh, really disappointed me because that's that that particular turn in her character is something that's been done mm-hmm. a lot. And the movie didn't really make fun of it in the or lampshade it or kind of like, hey, wait a minute, in the way that it did with everything else. I think okay, I understand what you mean about the first act because I I also think that it's a very sexist and very old school way of storytelling. Uh, and I yeah, of taking the character, but in that direction. you know something happens at the end, which I guess retcons. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't say that. Something happens at the end. No, that- I. I don't think <laughs> I don't think it was fixed, honestly. Mm. Yeah. I think that was a big joke. You see, that's the thing. What is a big joke and what is not? You know, what because if 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 what happens at the end of the movie does happen, nothing matters anymore. But you know, this movie doesn't matter, the previous movie doesn't matter, and none of the movies in the X Men timeline matter if we're supposed to take that gag seriously. But I think I I don't know, like because it's Deadpool, so it doesn't really bother me as much because like you say everything is one big joke and i think i i responded to emotional scenes because they they were happening as it was and the vanessa stuff i really liked because i really felt what deadpool or what wade was feeling and i really liked the 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 kid and you know it's clearly a a parallel to gay we have what are they called gay conversion camps where they feel bad right, yeah, for yeah, yeah. having being who they are. And I think because you can yeah, draw yeah. parallels from real life, that's why I felt the emotional weight. It's a little bit heavy-handed, don't get me wrong. But at least it's there. And I did feel it. And I think it's because of um, Ryan Reynolds' acting. Like He is a good actor. So it's really nice to see him with his dramatic chops in, in Deadpool of all places. <clears throat> yeah, I, I really liked it. I really liked the emotional scenes and they did get to me. The cable thing didn't really do that because we've seen it before and also mm-hmm. it's the same problem I had with yeah. Vanessa except we don't know much about his family so it's not... It doesn't right. hit me as much. Yeah, yeah. I, I get where you're coming from and I think what you've said made a lot of sense. I think like your your um point of view, the interpretation of like the orphanage as gay conversion therapy and like when you say that it's heavy-handed i think all of x-men is like the origin of x-men as a parallel to the civil rights movement to the gay movement like uh in the brian singer movies which you know are a bit hard for me to enjoy now because the things that have come out about brian singer but yeah mutant equals gay and in this one there's also a really good scene in which uh rusty talks about being overweight and how there aren't any overweight superheroes. So you're kind of like, maybe that's why he thinks I should try to be a villain, because there are overweight villains, but not overweight superheroes. And you're like, huh, there's a body image thing, and that's kind of a poignant thing to touch on in a goofy kind of film like this. So I did appreciate those those touches, those moments. Um, yeah, and, and like as in the relationship between Wade and Vanessa... I think you talked about how in the first movie that took away from the coolness of Deadpool. Like him, his entire linchpin, his raison d'etre being he likes a girl kind of makes him a bit less cool. Do do you still think that after watching this movie? No, I guess not. Yeah, so, so like if this movie fixed that for you then that's cool, you know? And I think that, that you're not the only person who felt that way about the first one. Yeah. So, it, it yeah, it's interesting because, like, yeah, that makes sense, right? The relation, like, our reactions to this movie are directly influenced by our reactions to the first mm-hmm. one. I, I think it's because, yeah... Um, yeah, the, the cable... What were, you, what, what, what were you expecting from this movie? Like, more or less the same, or...? Okay, I was expecting this movie to parody sequels, okay. which it kind of did to an extent. To parody team up superhero movies. Okay. And the sequence with the X Force does that. It kind of makes fun of the conventions of putting together a team and working together as a team. I was expecting a lot more cable plot. 
I was expecting Cable's backstory, the time travel, the twisty, screwed up timeline to be something that Deadpool gets involved in, that he makes fun of, that he comments about time travel, and that that is kind of the linchpin of the movie. I was also expecting, yeah, I think specifically all the posters show you Wade, Domino, and Cable. So I was expecting the three of them to be there front and center and to have equal time dedicated to the backstories and motivations of Cable and Domino since we know what Waits <clears throat> already is. Okay. Yeah, that was my expectation based on the trailers and whatever. And mine was, I just wanted to have a good time. Yeah. Yeah, and it is a good time. It's really entertaining. The jokes are super funny. Um, okay, uh, do you want to go on to spoilers now? Because I feel like there's a lot of things to spoil in this film. Sure, let's do that. Pl- um, loved, I, I really, I really like the Juggernaut song that they had. How did it go again? <laughs> um, I remember it ended with like, holy shit, holy shit, holy, holy, holy shit, or something like that. But, oh, it, that was great. Yeah, where it was like it was like spoofing sort of, you know, the Latin chanting that you get in dramatic trailers. It was kind of spoofing yes. O Fortuna from Kamina Burana, you know, the that you hear in a lot of trailers. And that Simon Cowell I love it. I love it so much. Because after he used it in X Factor, no one uses it anymore. <laughs> it oh, was really? funny. It was really, really funny. Um, yeah. I, I hated Juggernaut. I I thought, oh, this is this is gonna be so controversial. I thought he looked awful. I thought that the the character yeah, animation I... was awful. It was so bad. Yeah, but was it on purpose? Like they improved Colossus. They, that's the thing. That's the thing. I I it's so frustrating with this movie. Like any fault the movie has. I second guess myself. I go, was it on purpose? <laughs> and th- brilliant, you know, brilliant for the movie to have created that. Brilliant. I wish every movie had that kind of inbuilt excuse. And I think that's the magic of Deadpool, but that's also frustrating for me as someone who's looking at movies kind of critically, you know, and, and kind of like analytically. Uh, was it on purpose? I don't think so. I don't think it was meant to look that bad. Like, they make one joke about how there's a CGI fight. But mm-hmm. Wade doesn't say, like, what's wrong with your arms? Why are your proportions all wrong? And you know, what, why is that. your composition so odd? And Yeah, they could have lampshaded it with that. And it was so strange because, okay, by right, him wearing that prison jumpsuit should make it kind of easier than, than animating Juggernaut in a full, like his full Juggernaut armor. But I think part of it was the cloth sim. The cloth sim was kind of strange at that scale. Yeah. I think it's everything that's odd. Like, yeah, I totally I, didn't want... At the end of the day, I think... No, it's so strange. You you, you, you can break it down technically. I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, it's just the lighting that really doesn't sell it for me. Because he's so much lighter than... The integration. He's so much brighter than the other films. So, it, yeah, it was yeah, very yeah. odd to see him. But I... I... I really like the Colossus stuff. It's very sweet. Oh, hang on. Yes. Let, let's do. talk about cameos before I forget. The Brad Pitt cameo was really good. Okay. Cameos. Didn't realize. Didn't realize that the truckers. One of them was Matt Damon, and the yeah. other one was Alan Tudyk, right? And um, the X Men cameos. Yeah, neither did I. That was so great. Yeah, <laughs> like B sliding the door back it was hilarious. The X Men cameos kind of broke my my brain for a while because I'm like, wait, but where does this take place? Then I realized it doesn't matter mm. because it's Deadpool. Yeah. Yeah, it's off on its like timeline island of stupid, yeah. which I love. Which is I love the timeline island of stupid. I love that he says Patrick Stewart one moment and he says James Michael Ford the next moment. And I love that. I love the X Men timeline. I've already said this, and this just makes me love it even more, because it doesn't make sense, but I love it. Yeah, because it's it's lampshading, it's highlighting how it doesn't make sense in its own like subtle is a strong word, but in its own way. <laughs> and I don't know why I always <laughs> I I love that he oh. points out the fact that no one is ever there, and that the studio, despite the 
the, the, the success of Deadpool still wouldn't give them enough money for like one A-list X-Men character. Yeah, he's like, you think they throw us a bone, you think they give us more X-Men, and then you cut to all of them like having tea in a room and then B slowly closes the door. Mm-hmm. That was very funny. That felt like something you'd see in How It Should Have mm-hmm. Ended. Uh, what else is there? Uh, Peter? Yeah, okay, so cameos, oh, cameos. Um, sorry. Oh, um, sorry? what's his name? The one from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Terry Crews. Love seeing him in this. Yes. As a Bitlam. I guess he is a cameo, right? Yeah, technically it's a cameo. Oh, okay. Um, okay, uh, the Brad Pitt cameo. I will explain the Brad Pitt cameo. Uh, David Leitch, Leitch. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Okay, director man was a stunt double of Brad Pitt for about 10-15 years. Oh, okay. So he doubled for Brad Pitt in Fight Club and Mr. and Mrs. Smith in a lot of movies in Spy Game, a lot of movies that Brad Pitt has done. Mm -hmm. So he has a working relationship with Brad Pitt. And I think at one point they were considering Brad Pitt for Cable, but he couldn't commit to that. So he could, however, uh, turn up for two hours on a green screen to do the Vanisher shot. Oh, that's so good. And the moment... it's great, it's great. Like, when they all jump out of the, of the helicopter and you see the, just a close-up of a parachute with nobody attached to it, that was so funny. Mm-hmm. I, the, the whole X-Force <laughs> dying thing was amazing. I was, was so really, sad. Really good. I was really sad, though. It was a really sad scene for me. Especially, um, not his name, Peter. I love Peter. Yeah. He's, and I thought it was hilarious that everyone was speculating this is going to be Pete Wisdom. He's secretly a complete badass. I love that he's just a normal guy. No. And I love that Dick yeah, saved him so in the great. end. Out of everyone, he saved him. I was... Yeah, that's right. That's true. I was kind of sad about Louis Tan because, well, Louis Tan, man, he was almost Iron Fist. Then, then in this movie, he dies because his hair flapped in his face. I love that so much. That's hilarious. That's why Shatterstar died. It's because his hair flapped in his face. Let's see what else is there to talk about. And then Bill Skarsgård, the clown from It, he was uh, Acid Vomit Man. Oh, right. Oh, oh yeah. you see, I was Any so wise. excited because I saw Peter, Peter surviving. It's like, oh, thank God. And then he went to help, P- uh, what's his name again, the clown. Zeitgeist, yeah, vomit, vomity guy. <laughs> vomit guy. I was like, oh no, 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 no. He's gonna throw up all over yeah. P. <laughs> oh, I was so sad when he died. That's exactly what happened. Oh, yeah. Like, okay, so, um, question to you about, you know, the gore in this movie. Like, I think in the last film, you said that it wasn't kind of gory enough. Like, they cut away when it was about to get super gory. So, did you like that there was more gore in this I one? don't remember where they would go but I think I wasn't bothered by that because I don't remember it so that's my answer yeah I I think like it's very Looney Tunes violence it's very very exaggerated I mean the gore in terms of like you see Pete melting when that guy's vomits over him you see them going into the wood chipper and you see like body parts and intestines Mm -hmm. yeah like a comedy gore you know over the top slapstick gore I really liked it like, it people was very said, fun. I liked it it's too. It's very people, violent, but it's very people fun. People said this movie was good. Yeah. Yeah, people said this movie was going to be shocking. And uh, I think, like, mainly what people are referring to is perhaps the scene where his legs grow back. Oh, yeah. Like, the, 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 baby, the baby penis scene. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I thought that that joke went on a little bit long. Yeah, me too. And because you're re... They're, they're rehashing a joke that worked well in the first one. And I also, I'm not a fan of like dick jokes, so maybe that's why. So I thought that was just me, but I guess it's everyone. Yeah. Because yeah. you represent everyone to me, Jed. Uh, but, um. One thing that nigga... was funny. Sorry, yeah? <laughs> Hello. Hi. I am all people. <laughs> uh, one thing that was funny about that scene is I only found out watching the credits, but when he uncrosses and crosses his legs like Basic Instinct, they use the music from Basic Instinct by Jerry Goldsmith. Oh, cool. I didn't notice that. Um, Nigga Sonic Teenage Warhead. <sighs> okay, sorry. Nigga Sonic. Uh, can we just call her Nigga Sonic? Whatever. I really. No, you got it right the first time. You, you <clears throat> got it right the first time. Yeah, you did. Nigga Sonic Teenage she- Warhead. I wish she was in it more. She's really cool. Um, 
Yes. Like like that she's yes. a lesbian, I guess. Is she a lesbian or bi? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, man. It it yeah. I mean, uh, if I'm not wrong, Brianna Hildebrand herself has come out. Okay, as lesbian. so she's she's lesbian. I like that that they yeah, they're guess. very open about it. So that's very nice. Yeah, me too. Um, her girlfriend is very cute. I like the thing with her and Deadpool. Hi, Wade. What's the name again? <laughs> Yukio. Oh. Hi, she's Yukio. She's supposed oh. to be the same character. Yeah, she's supposed to be the same character as uh, Wolverine's bodyguard in the Wolverine. Oh, are they the same? They're not, right? They are the same character, but like different time. Okay. Lines. Or they just, yeah, that's what I've heard. Like at first when people saw her in the trailer and she had <laughs> electricity powers, we thought she was going to be Surge. Who is Japanese in the comics. But they call her Yukio. They don't call her Serge's um, civilian name. Which I cannot for the life of me remember. Because I don't know X-Men very well. Yeah. I, I liked her. She's very cute. Um, again, wish there was more Nega Sonic Teenage Warhead. Uh, I liked it when she showed up. That was really badass. That was really nice. Um, what else is there? Yeah. Yeah. What else should I just... Like, like, okay, I've... Oh, sorry, Fire Fist? Sorry. Uh, what do you think of him? Fire Fist, yeah, Julian Dennison. Um, like, I, I don't like that he was the main villain. I was very disappointed that he was the main villain. I wanted Black Tom Cassidy, who barely appears in this film, to be the main yeah. villain. Uh, yeah. Like, I thought that Rusty was going to be a first act plot device. I, I like that the actor had fun with it. I like that it's... Uh, I, I Like I said earlier, I like the scene where he talks about body image, where he talks about being mm-hmm. overweight and saying how there aren't any heroes who are yeah. overweight. And I like that Wade eventually establishes a genuine connection with yeah. him when this is a guy who like detests all things genuine. I, although I do feel kind of... I feel like Wade is, was... I didn't feel the relationship developing naturally because it felt like he only wanted to save Fire Fist so that he can die and be with Vanessa. So I'm... Right, I think that's how it started yeah, out. So, and then afterwards, like, he connected to him after the jail Yeah, scene. because he's like... Uh, he, he, we all lost something or something. But hang on, no, that, that was Cable. Never mind, I'm remembering it wrongly. That's also Rocket Raccoon. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Yeah. Um By the way, the Vanessa thing, the Vanessa thing is fridging, which I don't like. I really wish that they did something else with her. I mean, because she was a damsel in distress in the first one and then she died so that the male character can have character development, which I don't she's she's a cool character, so I don't like that they do this to her. And in the comics, she's copycat. She has powers. She becomes like a mutant, you know, she changes, uh, she's like a mystique kind of a character. So I was very, very disappointed with that. I checked out at that moment. I was like, oh no, that's what they're doing. And I expected smarter and, okay, from this movie. See, I thought, I thought because of that, she's going to become Death, the character Death, which I know that she has a relationship with... Um, yeah, yeah, good Deadpool. shot, good, good, good call. Yeah, so in the end, but she came back, so as in like Thanos' girlfriend. Yeah, okay, let's not go there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, <laughs> I thought because this film, if you have a character called Death and she becomes Death, you know, no one's gonna blink an eye because they'd be like, yeah, okay, she's Death now. Yeah, but I don't know. Then they the brought her back. The threshold is so high; you can do whatever. Um. So I. I really like the James Bond parody intro. It was so fun. And I love the song. I think it's a genuinely good song. Although my favorite part of the song when was when she goes... Good song. Yeah. Something like she... Th- there's this really... This sincere line. And after that she goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Which is my favorite part of every song. Ever. <laughs> when they have no idea what to write. So they just write, whoa. Yeah, and... It is, it is also so... Br- that's most of the songs in The Greatest Showman. Really? I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic parody. I love it. 
Yeah, and I, I think it is brilliant that they were able to snag Celine Dion mm-hmm. because, of course, Celine Dion is Canadian. Yeah. So, like, my my Celine Dion is coming to Singapore. Like, my fantasy is that I get her to hold a Deadpool custom that I've made, but it is not probably going to happen because I do not work the music beat, and I don't think she does interviews. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to Las yeah. Vegas. Sad face. Soon, so I uh, can bring it there and just hold it up oh, nice. during one of her performances, I guess. <laughs> I'm not going. Just throw it at her face. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so, like, like when they went in and they did the Bond, like, opening sequence, and they were like, wait, did they really just kill Vanessa? I was like, yeah, yeah, you did. You know, I don't, I don't see why that's, a, like, a big deal. In fact, it makes me disappointed in new movie. I and think I, was I think that's what point. I think that's what they were trying to do though. They're like, I know you're disappointed, so remember that this is the guy that killed the dog in Jack in Jack in in John Wick. Yes, in John Wick. Now I I think like okay, so here's my problem with killing Vanessa above and beyond fridging. In Aliens, you spend the whole movie rooting for uh, Ripley, Newt, and Hicks, and at the end of the movie, they become like this makeshift family unit. At the beginning of Alien 3, you find out that Hicks and Newt died. Mm-hmm. So you're like, okay, so what was I invested in in them in Aliens 4? You know, and that is the same thing that Simon Peck brought up because the producers of Mission Impossible wanted to kill Julia Ethan Hunt's wife, Michelle Monaghan. And he said, no, 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 don't do that because the whole of Mission Impossible yeah. 3 was saving the wife. So you got to have a cameo to show us the wife is okay. So that was Simon Peck yeah. being smart and, you know, sort of bringing on board the geek knowledge that he had. So this that immediately reminded me of that. Where it's like, so what is the big deal about saving Vanessa at the end of the first movie if that's all you're going to do? But okay, there's one thing I really, really loved about the scenes in Purgatory or in Hell or Heaven when Wade is trying to get to Vanessa. He can't because there's a wall. That's the one wall he can't break. Oh. Oh no, I didn't even think about yeah, that. No. <laughs> oh. He can break any other wall, but he can't break that wall. He can break the fourth wall, but he can't break that wall. So I thought that was beautiful in terms of like a visual image. And then I caught myself going, wait, but can I can I allow myself to be to engage with this sincerely? Because it's a joke and they're probably gonna punk me out at the end. So yeah, I, I'm glad you didn't have that problem. I'm glad that you you connected with with the movie on that level because I I could not. Mm. Um. Okay. Like I I read people saying I read one guy saying this is the first comic book movie my wife cried in, and I I felt like really, she didn't cry in Logan. <laughs> I I I didn't cry in Logan. I cried in Wonder Woman and Guardians 2 because they were very sad and it made me sad. Okay, I didn't yeah. cry in Guardians 2. I teared up. That's yeah. the difference, guys. Yeah. This one didn't it make is, me cry, but I did yeah. I did get the feel. I teared up at the end of Wonder Woman because I was I was so happy. Yeah. Like like I mean, um I I I we both cried in Man of Steel. I I yeah I think I, oh yes I did I did cry Man of Steel when he was in the closet oh man the flashback yes 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 that destroyed me okay that ruined me so bad yeah yeah so like like what I was saying about Aliens three and how that kind of nullifies the emotional impact so it's it's and yeah we were talking earlier about how at the end of this movie the post credit scene is wait undoing everything because uh. You know, Yukio has fixed Cable's time turner and and or whatever it's called. Uh, so they go back and he goes back to X Men Origins. He says, "I want to fix a timeline," and then he goes back even further. He goes back to Ryan Reynolds receiving the script for Deadpool uh, for Green Lantern, different movie. So yeah, then people are saying, "Does that mean the whole movie didn't happen?" And I'm like, "I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that. That's what happened. I can only accept that this is a post credits gap." Well, I think that it did happen, but that doesn't mean that the movie didn't oh, no. happen. 
But it means the movie didn't happen because he went back in time and he changed. But he like, he did change. He did, you know, know that he is a good father. Or he can be a good father. So I don't know. Like I think the character development is still there. It's just that it's the same weight. It's just Vanessa's alive this time. And the the ones that don't really make sense and I think our jokes clearly are, you know, the Green Lantern and the X Men Origins. Part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as in as in like the the, the, the teddy bear healing itself. Mm-hmm. That happened. But cable yeah. is still cable. Okay, but it, it didn't mean that that didn't yeah. happen to him. It just did, but in another world or in another or in an unto- in sorry, in an in an alternate universe that happened. Right. So it didn't really yeah, bother uh, me that much because I, I do think that the movie still happened. It's just that other characters or, you know, something else has changed. But the character that did change the timeline did experience what he experienced and kept what he experienced. Right, yeah. So so even though the circumstances changed, like Cable still has memories of his family dying and him coming to the present to team up with or fight and then team up with Wade. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, like, like the thing is, um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but I think in a movie that makes fun of everything, that lampshades everything, that kind of comments on lazy storytelling or comments on tropes and genre, that they did not comment about time travel in a similar way or the fridging in a similar way. I was waiting for Wade to unspool like a scroll list of dead girlfriends in comic books. Yeah, you see... And then adding Vanessa's name to the end. I, I did read up on that. Like, why did they go that story route? And apparently they were like, oh, we didn't know it was sexist. So, <laughs> they weren't aware. Oh my god! Yeah, that they oh were doing god. fridging. <laughs> That's hilarious! Because women in refrigerators is a thing for a long time. Yeah, they were like... They were saying that they were unconsciously... They, they weren't being consciously sexist. Which... Yeah, you know, it's like... No, yeah, yeah. It, it's like, um, Austin Powers, it is clearly trying to be sexist to parody the older James Bond films, mm. right? So, like, you don't get so yes, offended yes. by that. But yeah. this, when they said, you know, we didn't realize that it was sexist. You know, we didn't mean to be sexist. It's like, that's the problem. <laughs> you know, don't encourage this, but... Exactly, exactly. Whatever. I mean, not whatever. Please don't do it again. Yeah, and... I don't mind if women die. Once, once you... I don't mind if women die. Sure, neither... It's <laughs> just, don't make them... In films. Don't make them the plot point. Yeah, yeah. Like, like the death is solely to motivate the... That's classic fridging. And, okay, so here's the issue with them saying they aren't aware and why that kind of sucks is because these writers, like Red Reese and Paul Wernick and Ryan Reynolds... The whole script is meant to be aware of everything. Like, they are aware... There's nothing they're not aware of. They are so self-aware. They have reached self-awareness nirvana. So for this to be a blind spot is frustrating, you know? Oh, well. It's okay. One day you guys are going to get fridged too. Sorry. I'm kidding. Sorry. Who Who's going to get fridged? No, I'm saying guys will die for girls for their character development. Oh, sure, yeah, I yeah. think that has like, been like, happening. I guess Wonder Woman is sort of like that. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that happen a bunch. And dogs die for character development. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think dogs die. I think that was like only John Wick. <laughs> John Wick and um the, the Will Smith. <laughs> I don't think they are that cruel to kill dogs. I am dogs. legend. Yeah. No, yeah, we don't get... Oh, that movie, A Dog's Purpose, though. That was just dogs being fridged through the whole movie. Yeah. No, I'm not going to watch that. It it looks so sad. I don't want to see a dog yeah. die, die again. Like, I don't understand why you make a movie for dog lovers that is a dog dying. Yeah. A lot. I don't mm-hmm. understand that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, back, back to um Deadpool. Like, I think I've heard uh, Ryan Reynolds say he's not going to do a third one. And yeah. they're just going to do X-Force. So, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, me too. I think he should just make yeah. cameos in other films. Yeah, yeah, he should. 
and and so should Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I really wish he was in this film. Me too. Me too. The first shot of this movie is a custom action figure of him from Logan, where they took the X Men Origins Wolverine, uh, um, Logan, and they put like a tank top on him and they stuck him on the tree trunk. So that that was kind of fun for me to see that there's a custom action figure in this film. From the first shot, it doesn't really make sense with the timeline because all the X Men should be gone by then. But Logan exactly. happened, yeah. So they they love it, yeah. They I think they are like kind of rubbing it in our faces, and it makes sense. And it was so great that the X Men who we saw were the young X Men, were Nicholas Holt and Alexander Ship and James McAvoy. So that doubly, ma- and then he puts on the cerebral helmet and he says, "It smells like Patrick Stewart." Mm-hmm. So like like all of I mean my favorite joke in the first movie was when Colossus is Como is he professor and then he goes McAvoy or Stewart that was my favorite joke in the first one so they they doubled down on that in this These one timelines are so confusing okay yeah um yeah. yeah so I think that's it for Deadpool two uh I think the next two big films are The Incredibles two and Jurassic World. Fallen Kingdom or something. Oh yeah, like yeah. That. I'm I'm looking forward to Jurassic World. Did you like? Yeah, the first like one? Uh, anonymous. Uh, I did. I like Jurassic World. Okay, that was fine. I thought it was fine. I'm surprised <laughs> it made as much money as it did in the box office. Yeah. Um. So anonymous sauce. I'm not gonna review this person's name, but someone has watched it. Yeah. Um, uh, a person I know. They said it's really, really good. Good as in fun or good as in there's good character development? Good as in a well made like movie. Okay. Like a lot of suspense and Okay. And I, I love the idea of giving this to a Spanish horror movie director, of giving this to J. A. Bayona. Because I think that's a very good direction to take it in. I want it to bring it back to the scariness of the raptors in the kitchen. I want to bring it back to that idea of you know the 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 dark imagination of what are, what the possibilities of this kind of thing are, and I also like that this movie is gonna do a little bit of um going back to the past and talking about one of Hammond's partners in creating Ingen. There's a character mm-hmm. called Lockwood, played by James Cromwell, who is a guy who knew Hammond. So I I want more backstory stuff, and I want them to move away from running around on the island being chased by dinosaurs. And it sounds like. This movie is not only that. Okay, that's cool. I'm I'm also hoping for a yeah. good Jurassic yeah. Park film because I think the last four or five haven't been very good. Just fine. There have, there have only been four. Oh, four. Okay, sorry. So the last three have not been good. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I, I, the the only yeah. the only film I really did enjoy, obviously, is the first one. So I don't really recall. What happened in the second and third yeah. one? At least the world. All I remember from world was there were a lot of references to Jurassic Park, and that annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of fan service. They literally walked into a location. The from old the first museum. Movie. They picked stuff up from the first movie and put it down. Yeah. Yeah, the old like visitor center, and then they played the Jurassic Park theme on the piano, and I was like, "This is blatant fan service," but I don't care. I love it. So yeah. th- therein lies my weakness. I am part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not a problem. It's alright. No, I, I have a. Oh, thank you. I have a very if, strong. I mean, like, come on, they the play... of movies. Sorry, when they played the Harry Potter theme in front of Fantastic Beasts, I freaked out. <laughs> so, like, I totally get it. I just need to be yeah, on that level yeah. to appreciate that kind of fan service. Otherwise, yeah, it's just like with that franchise. <laughs> fan service. Oh, exactly. there's no story to this kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's why I love the Yoda scene in Last Jedi so much. Because that is fan service, that is storytelling. <laughs> okay. Like, the movie can't do without <laughs> that scene. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I had to bring it back up. Tell yourself that, to, Jack. Yeah. Tell yourself that. Okay, I'm kidding. You, yes. you like what you like. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you like what you like. Yeah, so, like... Uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your holiday. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and do Jurassic World and Incredibles, I guess. Yay! I'm... I'm... I have... Okay. I guess I'm hyped. Alright, bye. (laughs) Bye Bye-bye!